So you have had, Madeline Cunin, an amazing life of public service. Lieutenant Governor, Governor of Vermont, Ambassador to Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Deputy Secretary of Education under the Clinton administration. You have done so very much, and it has been a variety of really fascinating experiences. And I'd love to know, now that you are here and having done those experiences and you look back, what is the legacy that you think that you've created out of all the work that you have done in your life? Well, that's a tough question because only time will tell. Mm. And uh, I won't be around for the answer. But uh, (laughs) uh, I think probably the most important as I look back is uh, having women assume roles of leadership and responsibility and in that sense I've always been a feminist because I want women to succeed and I was fortunate in my administration that I came into office at a time when women were stepping into new roles and doing very well. Mm. Uh, Some had law degrees, some had advanced degrees, some just had talent without a degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, we still get together every summer, about six of us, uh, and we used to reminisce about and laugh a lot Now we're talking about getting older. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's talk about that team you had when you started out. Um, People like Sister Elizabeth Camden, Sister Janice Ryan, Gretchen Morse, Liz Bankowski. These are women who, in they have enormous reputations in Vermont for strong leadership and, and huge legacies. When you were all together in the beginning, planning your campaign and then becoming part of the CUNIT administration, What was that like to have this team of strong women and the ability and authority once you became governor to make the changes you wanted to make? Well, you know, we didn't think of ourselves as special. Um, We just did the job. Uh, Even though I knew being governor, I was paving the way for others in the future. and, Mm -hmm. And I knew that If I succeeded, others would succeed, and if I failed, it might be very bad. But uh, when we get together now, we just have a wonderful time. And I think there were lots of good men in my administration, too, Mm -hmm. but the women sort of had a sense of mission. I remember Gretchen Morse, um, when I appointed her, she said, how am I going to start? And the phone rang, and she said, Gretchen Moore, secretary. <laughs> and there she was. She was there. In the room. <laughs> what were your goals when you ran, and w- were you able to accomplish a lot of them when you were governor? Well, different goals came up at different times. I, I didn't have a sign in front of me that said do this or do that Mm -hmm. I had to do a lot by instinct by my own values Mm -hmm. Um, I mean the overall goal was to succeed to be a good governor and to make the lives of Vermonters better Uh, you know more access to education more Mm -hmm. access to housing Mm-hmm. Uh, so I just, I just did it one day at a time. Yeah. One of the programs that you are credited with starting, which is still around and hugely successful, is Dr. Dinosaur. And um, that was a remarkable program back in the day to start, and it's still around benefiting Vermonters. Are there other programs that you started that are still around that you were particularly proud of? Well, there's a... Uh, yeah program about uh, getting people off of welfare and into the workplace. Mm -hmm. Uh, But uh, 
I just wanted to give people the opportunity mm-hmm. uh, and whatever it took to do that, mm-hmm. that's what we worked on. Yeah. Um, the program f- from welfare to work was called Reach Up. Reach Up, which yes. is still there today. Yes. Yeah. So that worked well. And uh, the other thing is, you know, appointing the first female judge, uh, I remember when we were in the office of of the Supreme Court, Mm -hmm. and one of the judges brought her five-year-old into the austere room with the coloring book and crayons, and I thought, this is the first time that that has happened. I'm sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, point of the first people, it, you break a barrier, okay. and and once that barrier is broken, other women can. And I also took part in appointing men, mm-hmm. and I had a very good staff, which helped me a great deal. Mm-hmm. Was it a challenge for you to decide to appoint the first woman Supreme Court justice? Like, were, did you have any pushback? No, not at all. Yeah, the time had come, hadn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, it's taken a while. There there have been several really wonderful women justices, and now we have our first woman of color justice, Justice Nancy Waples, and she joined the Supreme Court in 2022, I believe, so... It has still taken some time. Yes, and nationally it's taken some time. It certainly as has. As we're watching and observing and feeling the campaign of Kamala Harris, who's the first woman and the first woman of color. Um, so it's still an issue, but not as big as an issue as before. Yeah, I mean, we had the Hillary Clinton campaign in 2016, and then when Kamala Harris won the vice presidential position in 2020, that was an enormous victory for women. But it took a really long time. Yes. (laughs) And it's still, I just heard the other day that black men have difficulty in voting for a black woman, which seems very bizarre. There's definitely some gender dynamics happening yes. underneath that voters take into consideration probably unconsciously. Yes. But it impacts us in a real way, doesn't it? Yes. What are your observations about the the Harris candidacy right now? And like, what would you tell her or, or advise her if you had a chance to talk to her? Well, I think she's doing everything right so far. Um, she's not... She's not replying to the snide remarks of the Republican campaign. Mm-hmm. She's just doing her thing, going straight ahead. Mm-hmm. And I think we also learned from the Hillary campaign uh, what to do and what not to do. Yeah. Um, so she's all, and I think the country has changed. Uh, the fact that she's attracting these huge crowds yeah. uh, makes a difference. Yeah. Now, you wrote a book a few years ago called Pearls, Politics, and Power about potential pathways for women to rise to high-level leadership like vice president and president. And do you think that the observations you made in that book, that was probably 15, 20 years ago, um, do you think that they're still valid? Do you think that Kamala Harris, as as one example, um, followed similar advice as what you put in your book, or did she do something different that we might not have thought of before? Well, I think she exudes self confidence. Um, so her experience in the lower courts and as Attorney General has fortified her. Mm. Uh, for this role yeah. and she, as she said she dealt with people 
like Trump, uh, so she knows how to handle them. I think it'll be very interesting to watch the debate yes, between Harris and Trump. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's a good debater. Yes, she is. You know, you pointed something important out, that she has great experience behind her. And I remember thinking the same thing about Hillary Clinton, former first lady, former senator of New York, former secretary of state. She had all the right ingredients, and yet her campaign was not successful. Do you think that experience alone and the do you think it's experience alone that's going to help Kamala, or has the country changed enough that they're more ready for a woman to be president? I think both are true. Uh, I mean, once once Joe Biden, President Biden, uh, endorsed her, uh, it's like the cork popped out of the bottle. Mm. All this pent-up feeling... Uh, exploded and the reason was I think partly that in the past months and years we've had to be quiet and just listen to the Supreme Court decisions that repealed Roe versus Wade and we couldn't we had no alternative and all of a sudden we did yeah. and, and joy just spread uh, and so far, this has been a very joyful campaign. Yeah. In contrast to the doom and gloom that Trump says we are in a failing nation, yeah. uh, a third world country, and that's so far from reality. And it's a refreshing change of message yes. that the Harris campaign has brought out. I think you're right. People are really grasping at that because it's so much better than the negative message coming from the opposite court. So I have heard it said that women and particularly black women need to run twice as hard, work twice as hard in order to be considered competent. Do you think that's true? Well, you know, when you're in a campaign, you work as hard as you can, uh, no matter what your color mm -hmm. or gender even. Um, you want to win, and failure is sort of floating up above your head, and you don't want to deal with it, you don't want to face it. So I'm not sure that you work twice as hard. You work hard, period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's bring it back to your time as governor in Vermont. You were a governor for six years, three terms, and you decided not to run again. And I'm curious, what made you decide not to run again? Had you achieved what you were hoping to achieve in office? Were you hoping to hand it off to the next generation? What was your thinking? Well, it was complicated. Hmm. I mean, I love politics. I I've been the governor, lieutenant governor, legislator, leader. But uh, I guess it's unusual for me to say this, but I didn't want politics to be my whole life. Hmm. Uh, okay. I wanted to do other things as well. And politics is all-consuming. Yes. I mean, you give it everything. And... It affects the people around you, and uh, I didn't know quite what I would do, but I was fortunate I had a position at Harvard and, and at Dartmouth, uh, and I knew I wanted to write, but you can't write well, and I can't write anyway while I'm in office, because writing is an internal process, mm -hmm. and politics, you out there, uh, and uh, I just wanted to, I was curious about the next chapters of my life. Huh. Now, one of the things you did fairly soon after leaving office was, I believe you started the Institute for Sustainable Communities? Yes. You want to talk about that? Yes. Uh, I was a strong environmentalist when, when I was... Um, 
in the legislature and, and as governor. And uh, it just, I was asked to be an election observer when the newly formed democracies after communism began to emerge. Mm -hmm. So I was invited to be an election observer in Bulgaria. Mm. And it was me and the president of Iceland. And they referred to us as the president and the governor. Little did they know that the president had a smaller constituency <laughs> than I did. <laughs> but it was very exciting to see the transformation. Uh, you know, we, we brought a flip chart, just a plain old paper and crayon flip chart to a meeting of people in Bulgaria and wrote down their ideas. And that was the first time in their experience that somebody had validated their ideas in the public forum. <laughs> and. Uh, I asked George Hamilton to come with me uh, to be a, help me be an election observer. And he was a very capable young man. And so he has led the Institute for Sustainable Communities. He's now on the board. But uh, I knew they needed help to make the transition from communism mm -hmm. to something else they weren't quite sure. And it survived. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy that it has yeah. survived. And so has the Institute of Sustainable Communities. That's, That's still what I mean. The, the, okay. The Institute for Sustainable Community. And are they still a, a global organization? That... Yes. Nice. Yes. It's a little smaller under new leadership that we work in the United States in helping communities come up with energy plans oh. and uh, sustainable development. Mm -hmm. So it was Gro Harlem Brundtland uh, from the United Nations which inspired me. Hmm. That It's another example of your legacy in that that's something you started it's still around today and it's still doing good work yes look at the hummingbird oh right there <laughs> he's still there and he's back <laughs> um so so after or you had established the Institute, you were observing the election in Bulgaria, and then you went on to become Deputy Secretary of Education under the Clinton administration. How did that come about, and, and what was that um, experience like? Well, I was, um, I was invited to be on the transition team for Clinton. Ah. And uh, at first, there were just three of us on that team. Uh, and uh, it was a fascinating experience. Eventually, it broadened out, and there were more people. But uh, being on the transition team enabled me to be part of the administration. Mm -hmm. And when you were there, what was your experience, and what maybe what a uh, deputy secretary of education does? Well, my role was mostly management and outside speaker. Mm. I spoke to a lot of education groups, explained our agenda, and uh, I also did my best to pep up the team. Um, <laughs> it's interesting that uh, Trump wants to eliminate the Department of Education, and that's not the first time there have been hmm. movements in the past, but it's always reared its head again and survived. Hmm. And the important part, I think, is uh, 
it manages the loan program, the, the tuition loan, which mm-hmm. has always been difficult. And my job was to institute something called direct lending instead of going through a middleman. Mm-hmm. And the uh, middlemen organizations fought it very hard because mm-hmm. they made a profit on sure. college loans. Sure. But I found that my experience as governor was very useful Hmm. Uh, at the federal level, and uh, the person, Richard Riley, who was head of the Department of Education, was, uh, we got along very well, Hmm. and he gave me a lot of responsibility. Hmm. And when you say that your role as governor helped with that, was it the the gravitas that you brought to the position, or your knowledge of the system? Yeah, just how programs work. Hmm. Okay. At the local level, you know, you can design something in Washington, and it doesn't necessarily fit in Montpelier. Sure, which is something we hear a lot on every program. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, how you made a transition from that role to become an ambassador, and to ambassador, ambassador to Switzerland, and you were a young girl when you were living in Switzerland and then you came to the United States. Can you talk about how you came to the United States from Switzerland and then how it felt to be, go full circle and become an ambassador to Switzerland? Well, it was kind of poetic to go back as ambassador because I never dreamt, and my mother certainly didn't dream that her daughter would be ambassador one day. Yeah. I, have, I had an older brother Edgar May, Mm -hmm. and uh, he was supposed to do things like that. Uh, (laughs) And uh, anyway, when I came, I was I was almost six years old when we came in 1940, and it was the beginning of World War Mm Two, and my mother wanted to come to America where she knew she would be and her children would be safe. Mm -hmm. And for me, the voyage was an adventure. But uh, I remember that first summer, we came in June, and we managed to um, have have a room in a rooming house on the beach. And I was on the beach, and I met a child my age, and I came... And I, and I understood when she said hello, and I went running back to my mother and said, I can speak English. <laughs> <laughs> the good thing is when you're young, you learn the language very quickly. Sure. And uh, but I was supposed to be in second grade, and uh, they put me back to first they didn't know what to do with non-English speakers mm-hmm. in those days. So uh, I was put back in uh, earlier grade. And as a result, I was always the oldest person in my class. Sure. But uh, you learn quickly. Mm-hmm. And education has always been a goal to get as much of it as I could. Mm-hmm. How did that experience of coming to the U.S. and escaping danger in your home country, how did that inform your decisions, your life in the future? Well, very much so. Um, Of course, I'm in favor of immigrants, not not just hordes piling in regardless of their um, qualification, but I was inspired by the American dream Mm. that in America you can do anything. And my mother inspired both me and my brother. Uh, My father died when I was two, Mm. um, so she brought us up. We didn't think of ourselves as a single-parent family. That phrase hadn't been coined yet. Mm -hmm. But she... She inspired us. 
uh, by her faith in America. Mm -hmm. And actually, my father had made business trips with my grandfather to the United States and imported shoes and boots from America. Hmm. And uh, so we had some relatives in the United States uh, on my mother's side, too. And I think that gave her confidence in coming here. Sure. And when you were ambassador to Switzerland, um, I remember reading that you observed as an official delegate, delegate from the United States, you were observed um, court activities regarding the repatriation of um, Jewish bank accounts from the Swiss National Bank. Was that, what was that experience like? That must have been a very um, challenging and difficult thing to do. Well, it became a big issue uh, because some Jewish families from Austria and other countries deposited money in Swiss banks for safekeeping. Mm -hmm. And there were middlemen who took care of this. And after the war, uh, the heirs of those who died in the Holocaust and some of the survivors of the Holocaust wanted to get that money back. And the Swiss were very careful. And they even asked for death certificates mm -hmm. from concentration <clears throat> camp survivor heirs. And of course, there were no death certificates right. in the concentration camps. So that's an issue that occupied me just about every day hmm. in one form or another. And some people thought that Clinton appointed me for that reason. Well, he didn't appoint me for that reason, but it turned out that I felt that was a, a mission that I was personally responsible for, for mm. fulfilling. And uh, in the end, there was a resolution by a judge in New York, but, and it wasn't by the bank, it was a court order. And uh, the Swiss, I'm proud of being born in Switzerland and I'm proud of being an American. But uh, there's a side to the Swiss which makes the banks very powerful. Mm -hmm. They're like a branch of the government. Mm -hmm. But I was happy I could play a small part. Mm -hmm. And in the end, they did end up um, repatriating some of the yes, money, correct? they did because of the judge in New York. Okay. How did it feel as... Uh, uh, escaping Switzerland or Germany and Nazi Germany as a Jewish child coming to the United States and becoming Vermont's first Jewish governor, becoming such a prominent leader? Well, I don't think it affected me at all as a child. Mm -hmm. I didn't experience <clears throat> anti-Semitism. Uh, my mother brought us up Jewish and we went to Hebrew school, but I didn't feel prejudice. Mm -hmm. uh, being a Jewish government, governor, I uh, thought that might be a barrier, but thanks to Vermonters, it really wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I'm very grateful for that. I mean, not everybody even thought I was Jewish, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I was treated like any other candidate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you were on the campaign trail, did you, we've talked many times about women running for office and the, the barriers, and we'll talk a little more about that. But when you were running for office, did you experience anything as a female candidate that you would attribute to being a non-male candidate that, that, gave you pause or gave you trouble? Were there barriers that you experienced as a candidate 
that you felt were specifically because you were female? Well, it was subtle, except I remember one person in Springfield, Vermont, when I went into a barber shop on the main street, and the barber said, I'll never vote for a woman. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty clear. <laughs> but I didn't try to convince him. I just right. left. Um, I think if there was a barrier, it was subtle. Mm. Uh, but it was also an advantage because women really rally around me and as they are around Kamala, mm -hmm. I think women feel a, an allegiance or an alliance with with a female candidate if she stands for the things that they stand for, mm -hmm. like abortion, uh, which is going to be a key issue in this election. Well. So uh, we may be moving into an era of more women in not only in public life but also in private life mm -hmm. more women leaders mm -hmm. and there still is some bias but you can't dwell on that because it's discouraging mm -hmm. you have to assume all things being equal and do the best job you can mm -hmm. Madeline, when you were a legislator and um, you had young kids at home and, you know, were a parent throughout your political career, how did being a parent influence your work and how did it, you know, did you experience any challenges being a mom, being a legislator and a lieutenant governor and a governor? Yes, I mean, I felt, I felt waves of guilt <laughs> Uh, I think, you know, when you have to be in, in one place and it's your child's birthday, I remember arriving after the candles were blown out and I felt so badly. Mm -hmm. But about the first time I had to be in Montpelier, right after I was elected to meet the governor and I went with it I was planned to go with the carpool and uh, I drove to Grand Union to meet my carpool and I looked in the back of the car and there was Daniel's baby blanket and he couldn't go to sleep without it <laughs> he, he was one of those children totally attached to his baby blanket. So I said to the group, should I go back? They said, go back, go back. So I went back and gave him the blanket. And when I left, my children said, don't go, mommy, don't go. Oh. And it was a wrenching, wrenching moment. <laughs> but it was the worst one I ever experienced. It never got so bad after that. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky I had a woman who took care of the children when they came home from school. Mm -hmm. I never had a live-in uh, nanny, but and my husband was helpful, uh, even though he's a physician. Uh, he did more than most men did at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, so... You go through moments of doubt and stress, but you keep going. Right. And now, unfortunately, they're all grown up and pretty good kids, <laughs> wonderful kids. With a role model. Did you, did you feel like you were a role model when you were doing all that as well? Like the waves of guilt, no mom can escape them. But there's also the fact that you were being a role model for them. Did you think about that at all? I thought about that when I lost my first campaign for governor mm. uh, because the incumbent governor Dick Snelling decided to run against what had been first he stepped down and then he changed his mind mm -hmm. and 
I, I lost, where I lost, respectably, if there was such a thing, mm -hmm. narrowly. And when I had to decide whether to run again, which I was encouraged to do, I did it. I thought of my children because mm -hmm. I thought it's a good thing to prove to them when you get knocked down, you can get yeah. back up. Yeah, yeah. Well, and now fast forward to 2024, and there are 45% women in the legislature. Yeah, that's terrific. Our attorney general, our speaker of the house, mm -hmm. our secretary of state are all women. And we have sent the first woman to Congress in Vermont history. And a lot of that stems from the work that you did to get more women to run for office which you know was something that you did by your example all along and by encouraging people to run for office. But then eventually you formed Emerge Vermont for the specific purpose of training women, democratic women to run for office. How did, what was your thought process about why we needed to do that and, and why you thought Emerge might be a tool to get there? Well, I had been invited by uh, California Emerge which was the first emerge um, to speak at their annual fundraising. And then I was invited to Massachusetts as they formed emerge. And so I thought to myself, why not Vermont? Even though we even then had pretty good ratio of women in the legislature. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turned out to be far more effective than I had anticipated. Mm -hmm. uh, one statistic that I enjoy quoting is that 80% of those who took a merge and ran for office were successful. They mm -hmm. were elected. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty good Proofs ratio. In the pudding. In the pudding. <laughs> yes. Yes. So I'm delighted with the merge. Yeah. And you know, men don't need to be taught how to run for office. Maybe they should be, but they're not. But they they have more role models. Mm -hmm. They know more people in politics. Mm -hmm. They know more fundraisers. Uh, but women are walking into a man's world, mm -hmm. and they still they still need encouragement and. We're used to studying for things uh, yes. <laughs> and for getting grades. And Emerge provides a curriculum that is useful for public life. Right. And they, we've just had tremendous success yeah. with it and good leadership, like my questioner here. <laughs> uh, we uh, Elaine Haney, uh, it's, it's, I mean, the success proves the need. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this week's primary results, 96% of the Emerge alums who ran for office won. 96 percent. So That's there are 48 terrific. women on the ballot, 46 of them won, and are moving on to the general election. And that's a testament to not just the training, but the network and the the relationship building, because as you said earlier, women are walking into a man's world in politics where they have connections, they have established processes, and, and they know everybody, and there's just, it's difficult to break into that. And so one of the wonderful things about Emerge is that the women who train with it, they stick together and they support each other and yes. they volunteer on each other's campaigns and they make contributions. And so you have this instant group of people who are going to support you simply by virtue of having gone through the training. And I think that's really a compelling reason why some women train with Emerge. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we have 45% women in the legislature currently. We'll see what happens after November, whether that number goes up or down. But there is a trend right now that folks are noticing that women this election cycle are running for office less. So in the national scale of things, the number of women participating in elections this year is lower. And it includes a lot of incumbents 
who have decided not to run again. So um, I'm curious what you think the long game is for women candidates in general and how women can maintain the uh, strides they've made so far. Well, I think both for women and for men, politics has gotten meaner. Mm. Um, And I think women in particular are very uncomfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And the more we can make it as as civil process where the basic rules of of politeness Mm -hmm. uh, at least are out there. Um, So... I mean, we're seeing, we saw something very dramatic when Kamala Harris uh, was endorsed by Biden and the world changed mm-hmm. from mean politics yeah. uh, to more civic politics. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think the more women who are elected, the more we'll run for office because yeah. they can see themselves reflected there. Exactly. And I think people like Joe Kowinski, the Speaker of the House in Vermont, mm. uh, just the fact that she's there will inspire more women to run. Right, right. Now, she's leading a supermajority of Democrats in the House, and she's part of the supermajority of Democrats in the whole legislature. How are you feeling that the large number of women in our legislature is impacting Vermont? Well, I haven't followed the legislature that closely, but I know issues like paid family leave, uh, are very important to women mm-hmm. and having that on the agenda uh, wouldn't happen if there weren't a significant yeah. number of women. And the child care bill, yes. that kind of thing. People ask me a lot, well, why do women, you know, why is it so important to have more women in office? And in, in addition to the importance of, you know, equity and parity and, and, making sure that women can see themselves. I often say that women lead differently, more collaborative, tend to lean across the aisle more often. Um, There's been studies done at the congressional level that democratic women who uh, have the highest percentage of bills introduced, the highest percentage of co-sponsors, and the highest percentage of bills being made into law. And so I'm curious if, um, if that was your experience. Like, did you feel like over the years when you were working with women either on your team as governor or as you observe them going forward, whether you found that the leadership style of women is different enough that it's responsible for additional success? I'd say it was somewhat different, but then you do have women who emulate the male model Mm. and believe they have to be tough and fierce and even angry, mm-hmm. but I think there is there is a tendency to move in, into the collaborative mm-hmm. agenda. Yes, yeah. and and it works. It does. Now I've been asked many times: Is there a training program for Republican women? And as far as I can find, not in Vermont. And there are trainings at the Republican National Committee level that anyone can take. But it does not appear that the Republican Party has focused on women very much. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts about why Democratic women seem to be making so many strides in leadership, but that conservative women are not necessarily making the same strides. Or is that is that even accurate? It probably is fairly accurate. Uh, <laughs> But I think the issue is abortion. Mm. Um, Democratic women can be have to almost be open-minded about abortion care, uh, and Republican women can't even stick their toe into it. Yeah. So that leaves out a lot of good potential Republican women. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
So you have turned to writing in your career after you said that when you were elected, it was a very difficult time to focus on writing, but now you have multiple books and books of poetry to your name. And so how has becoming a writer been for you? And what, what is your goal there? Well, it's been a happy surprise that I've turned into a poet uh, and a writer. My first books were about women in politics and uh, I was trying to encourage women to run for office. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I turned into a poet. It's as as if this door opened and I walked through it and emerged with poetry. Mm -hmm. But I was drawing more on my private self. Mm -hmm. Uh, My poems are pretty clear. They're not obscure like a lot of modern poetry Mm -hmm. is. And uh, I'm pleased that people respond to them. They see themselves uh, in the poems, and it's been a great pleasure. And I wondered if I could ever be called a poet. And last year, my, my book was a finalist for a poetry contest Wonderful. Um, sponsored by independent bookstores in in New England. So it's it's a different side of my poet, of my bio mm-hmm. uh, and I'm pleased that I can do it. Well you have come full circle from public servant to private chronicler, but you're sharing that with the world through your poetry and your writing. And um, this has been an absolute pleasure and honor to talk with you, Madeline. Oh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for sharing all of your gifts with Vermont, with the United States, with the world. And um, we're so honored to have you as a role model and someone we all look up to. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And I'll do my best to live up to your expectations. <laughs> you already have. <laughs> so far, so amazing. I, I know I speak for so many women in Vermont politics in particular who see you as the person we want to be. I know I feel that way. I know that there are many women in prominent positions who hope to have the level of service and the the integrity that you do and that you brought to your your roles. So thank you for that. Thank you. (laughs) 